welcome to Integrated. This is the podcast where we seek to bridge the gap between the intellect and the will so that we can grow as disciples of Christ, surrendering all that we are and all that we have to the truth. Hey guys, welcome back to Integrated. My name is Angela Erickson and I am thrilled to have you back with me again for another episode. I I'm so excited to share this one with you. I finished interviewing Dr. John Brutelski. um, And before I I share a little bit about that episode, please like, subscribe, and share this episode. That is like one of the biggest ways you can help me out. Um, This is an episode you're going to want to share. And uh, yeah, I'm just so excited about it. It was such a great interview. Um, Kind of a backstory about this, this interview. I, we had initially interviewed, like done an interview back in December and it was, it was just spiritual warfare. Like if if any of you know, especially pro-life work, but I feel like with this podcast, I've had so many weird things happen, uh, when I'm trying to record these really great interviews with people. And, um, this was just another one of those days where it just was not working and I, I tried to deal with the audio issues, but it was just, it was more than I could do anything about. So we rescheduled an interview and I have to say, I'm so glad that we did because this interview, the other interview was really good. This interview was even better. Um, we talk about everything. I mean, for those of you who maybe aren't familiar with, with Dr. John Bruchowski, he, he is now the author of the book, Two Patients, um, My Conversion from Abortion to Life Affirming Medicine. It's published by Ignatian, Ignatius Press. Uh, but he was in medical school. He was committing abortions while also helping women deliver their children. Um, and he just had this crisis, uh, when he encountered two patients at the same time. And we talk a little bit about that in this episode, but really kind of the, the focus of this interview ended up being relating to our lady and, uh, our Lord's broken body. And, um, and the integration of the human person, mind, body, and soul, and what that means physically in motherhood, um, but also kind of the, the larger forces at play in terms of politics, uh, economics, philosophy, um, understanding who we are in relation to God, our own anthropology. Uh, there were just so many things that we talked about. It was such a big interview, um, big in ideas, big in perspective, uh, sort of I don't know the way that we sort of wet, wove together an understanding of motherhood and, and our children and the impact that abortion has, um, and what abortion is symptomatic of. And, um, yeah, it was just a, it was a crazy, wonderful interview. I'm so grateful, Dr. John, if you're listening, thank you for coming on. It was such a pleasure to talk to you about all of this stuff. Um, because Dr. John Bruchelski, you can tell this is something he's thought a lot about. It's not just the the small issues, but really looking at the whole person and the whole problem or problems. (laughs) Um, So anyway, it was such an insightful interview. You're going to love it. And I'm, I'm just, I'm overjoyed that we were able to have this conversation. So thank you so much. Thanks for joining me again on integrated. If you uh, want to support the work that I'm doing, please uh, maybe consider becoming a patron. If you like this interview, uh, you can join me over there. I'll be doing some more stuff over on my Patreon. now that this podcast is a little bit more established and, and I'm planning on doing a, um, a book study for Lent with my patrons on the introduction to the devout life with St. Francis de Sales please join me over there. You can become a patron for as little as five bucks a month. So like less than a fancy coffee (laughs) per month. Um, or if you're not interested in, in, uh, becoming a patron, which I totally understand, but maybe you still want to financially support the work that I'm doing to, to help help offset the costs of running a website and social media, all that stuff. Um, Maybe you would consider giving a one-time gift over on my website or using the the link tree in all of my social media bios, but I'll definitely post it in the description because I know for some of you that's, uh, you just would have rather done that, um, than, than offer monthly support, which I, again, totally understand. Two other fun ways that you can help support integrated is by heading over to star of the sea gifts and using the discount code 
integrated 10 to get 10% off. Or you can go visit OurLadiesCloset.com to buy some beautifully handmade dresses uh, and some other items as well. And you can also use the discount code integrated10 there as well to get 10% off and support the show. So for those of you that have used integrated10, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Hit like, share, subscribe. I hope that you guys love this interview as much as I did. And uh, I'm praying for you. Uh, May you live life integrated. God bless you. You know, as we'll talk about within your book to patients, which you are, you and your team were kind enough to send me an advanced copy of several months ago. Um, this, this topic of suffering and whether we're suffering ourselves or witnessing suffering, um, looking at the Pieta as you have behind you, it's actually probably one of my favorite images of our lady and, of our crucified Lord. It's just such a powerful image. And so would you mind kind of starting off here talking about what you were describing in terms of learning how to suffer and what you're learning in your contemplation regarding suffering? Sure, Angela. And uh, I really appreciate, um, I just really appreciate that 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 ability to recognize the connection. Uh, Ever since I became a um, a physician after my residency, the Lord has saw fit to um, bring me significant um, illnesses and diseases about every several years, it seems, to uh, embrace the actually visceral uh, issues of my practice of medicine. Because medicine is about caring, not always curing. And my practice of medicine is about engaging the reality of human flourishing. And the way the world is today, no pain, no gain. Meaning we have to walk through suffering in order to strengthen ourselves, both bodily and physically. Yeah. And at Tepiac and Divine Mercy Care, we believe in integrated health care, meaning body, soul, and spirit. Women's health is more than just abortion as essential health care. Right. It's much more than uh, pumping class one carcinogens into your body, shutting off your pituitary, shutting off your ovaries. Mm-hmm. So... We can have sexual freedom, and we are all pursuing happiness that leaves us depressed, as, right. as the dollars tell us. So, because you know God has a sense of humor, my first disease was metastatic testicular cancer that gave me what? A positive pregnancy test. Mm. So I had morning sickness. But it was metastatic, and it was in my, the base of my brain and up my aortic lymph nodes. Wow. And chemotherapy, which I generally see as rat poison, um, helped take care of me. Mm-hmm. I had great doctors who cared for me. But it was one thing after another. And when you're hit this way, you begin to engage suffering as, why me? How could a good God, how could a good God do this? And lo and behold, because the mother of God has been such a part of my own life, obviously as a child being loved, you know, I I'm looking at my, our lady of Chestahova back behind me here, Yes. but that's what I grew up with. That's what I was weaned on. Mm. I was fed at that, at that breast, at that heart, because as a John, I've put my head on the heart of Christ and on the heart of his mm-hmm. mother. And I think that's because I was Polish. And I'm telling you that right now with the world so broken and my profession of medicine trying to tell us that we need to go along with a fluid gender, that we're now talking about pregnant people, not oh, pregnant my goodness. women. Yes. On top of Oh, by the way, contraception is how you treat 12 to 50 year olds, and then you put them on more hormones from 50 to 80, and you 
treat fertility as a disease yes. rather than something healthy. And my profession, oh, by the way, are the ones telling us that there is no truth. Um, human life is fungible. Sometimes it's about if the mother wants it. It's about whether there's implantation. Uh, you can manipulate embryos like slavery and property rather than children and loved. And I look at the Pieta and I try to understand how this woman could hold that hard, crusty, dead, musty. You know, I have been in an emergency room taking care of gunshot victims with shotguns blasts mm. and and high round two, two, three rounds that have caused cacophony within their body, destroying tissue. Yeah, yeah. That's what she was holding. He took on the Roman brutality of crucifixion for us. And I, oh, on top of it, he also took on all the sins that we ever have, are, or will commit. And he did it because he loved us. Mm -hmm. Now, because I believe in the triumph of the Immaculate Heart, because it's nothing more than the triumph of God's sacred, merciful heart, because she always points to him and her only she lived the grace that he provided her. That was it. Do whatever he tells you was right. because she was graced from her conception. And so she's holding this dead body. And at that moment, Angela. She was the only one in the world after his earthly life who understood him, knew him, was leaning into the brutality, knowing that she had to go through it because Simeon told her, yeah, I think it's going to pierce your heart too. Mm -hmm. Scriptural, biblical, theological, but it's relational. I look at her and I go, okay, uh, mother from John 19, 26 and 27. What are you trying to tell me? You are my mother, and I love the family relationship that we find in our faith and in our profession of medicine. Mm -hmm. But she's holding this dead body. I look at the church today with all the confusion and the abandonment and, you know, all the blessings and challenges that the church has faced from that moment. And if the side of Christ is the font of divine mercy that I believe it is, that's going to help renew medicine, help renew the world where the Holy Spirit came from in that blood and water. She touched and held him and still believed. Mm -hmm. I ask her for that intercession and I thank her for her witness and her example. I'm, I'm so, that's how I view this. Mm -hmm. And that ties in so richly with this issue of abortion. Now, the last interview that I published um, with my friend, Brian Gibson, he runs a sidewalk counseling organization that I, I sit on as a board member. Um, and he recalls just the, the really horrifying moment that he, somebody on his team discovered 13 aborted children that had been left in a dumpster behind an abortion facility. And they they found every single body and they held those bodies in their hands. And I think you are very intimately uh, connected with that, but holding those poor innocent children, the very image of God within their hands and uh, seeking a, a proper burial for them and showing the media, like this is what abortion is. And here in Minnesota, where right now our state legislature is, pushing the most radical abortion agenda that we have ever had codifying abortion through birth and and add and we, we already don't really have any restrictions and so they're just codifying what's on the books not allowing us to regulate or restrict whatsoever and then they're trying to rescind as well they introduced another bill um, to rescind any laws that provide care for children who are born alive in an abortion um, and you know, reporting laws, as well as a dignified burial for aborted children. Um, and you just see the spirit of death and evil that has come over our nation. So what is that like for you as a physician oh. who was, you know, ha you've been intimately involved in the practice of abortion, but at the same time, um, you know, God redeems us and he changes our heart. Like my friend talked about this last night that, 
when he was very young, he had a powerful conversion. I was at a prayer rally at the state capitol last night um, for over all of this stuff. And uh, he said that during his initial reversion back into the church, uh, a mentor of his said that the most powerful miracle that God can bring about is a conversion in our own hearts. And those are the quiet miracles that we don't necessarily see because they don't seem as profound. And yet scripture reminds us of this, like the paralytic, right? He, he forgives his sin and to prove it because no one believes him and believes in that conversion to bring about a physical sign of that healing. He heals him and, and he says, pick up your mat and walk. And for all of us, like we're called to that sort of conversion to embrace those miracles in our hearts. And you've done that. So what is it like for you as a physician to look at the state of our nation right now and knowing exactly what abortion is and exactly what it's like to hold those cold, dead bodies? So, um, you know, Angela, our lives are so intertwined uh, and I'm so grateful to be on this incredible program with you. You are in medicine, um, when I had finally a chance to come to my senses leaving the slop, um, our, our, our tagline was transform hearts through healthcare, one at a time. Mm. And I believe it at all that what you said and how the Lord comes full circle. So I have counted the body parts of a 10 week, a 12 week abortion to make sure I got all the limbs and brains and skulls and spines out of the woman's body. I literally had to go through that tissue with my gloved right hand. Um, my right hand twisted off limbs off of 14 to 16 week abortions. So, this was no longer an intellectual or ideological or politicized reality. Now, as I began to notice that my heart, because of these activities, oh, and by the way, if there was so much fear within the mother mm -hmm. that she wanted her child aborted at 21 weeks, yeah, because there may be a deformity or maybe a non-treatable disease. Oh, the best thing I need right now is to end this life and prevent more suffering. Yeah. So as you can see the connection, because once again, and I'm going to say this, you know, most abortionists believe they're helping women and oh, eliminating absolutely. suffering. Yes, they're they not, do. You know, these are not... Many you have, you have most of idea. them are not monsters. No. They're you know, most of them are not Gosnell, but they are playing a role in facilitating the exact same thing. Because they we now think we're God. Yeah. We now everything is in I create my own realities. Yes. And I I can interpret scripture however I want. Mm -hmm. And I can be yeah. a Christian abortionist. Yes. Because once you eliminate say the teaching of a church for 2000 years where you throw out the magisterial's interpretation of faith and reason and morals mm -hmm. all of a sudden you're left to your own devices and you begin to the echo chamber of reading only those in your mind view and how mm -hmm. you view reality anyway so here i was my heart was hardening and it was the witness of um, Dr. Debbie Plum who said, hey, Johnny, why are you treating, what, <laughs> excuse me, hey, Dr. Brjohn, Dr. Brzezowski, she came in right after I aborted this baby because the mother didn't want it. I wanted to help her. I didn't want it. So I broke water at 23 weeks while I was in the other room saving a baby at the same age that 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 um, cognitive dissonance, yes. the physical dissonance, the visceral dis. You know, th in Hebrew, the word heart. Um, I believe it's lev, l-e-v. In Hebrew, it means heart, gut, and mm. womb. <laughs> it's mm. the deepest, darkest, most 
it's it's who you are at your core. Right. So it kind of encapsulates the soul because that's there, where the soul resides. That is correct. And that's yeah. why this dualism that has come into science where, yeah. you know, you could be a human, you could be a human life, but you don't have consciousness. Uh, they split that up. And they're now they're putting a wedge between mom and her child. And they do it from... Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. And we're and you, you and and Miss V there, Miss, you know, your daughter. Yeah. Intertwined by one layer of cells called Nitta Books layer, where the placenta is intimately attached. M- yeah. Meshed, melded, where a few of her cells will continually flow through your veins yes and arteries whether you abort it or not microshimerism is that the term for it of course yes and, and so here we are yes. in a world where you know bleeding the life is in the blood as we've been told by our jewish brothers and sisters mm. you know the people that where we've come from as monotheists and Christians and Catholics, I'm telling, I believe that because I held bodies and I looked at the body and said, this is, this is nothing. Well, why is it nothing, John? Well, the mother doesn't want it. Well, uh, we didn't want Native Americans and we didn't want Jews and we didn't want Polish people and we didn't want women. Irish. And today we still don't want female babies oh but that's that's sex right that's not gender but no right. we're still aborting sex sex genetic, abortions. Sex yes. abortions and so now he comes full circle and now i can hold bodies of children that we tried to help and see the wailing and the suffering of the mother which sounds physically different in my experience than the mother who's aborted her child. Mm, That's why we've gone to a perinatal hospice to get mommy and baby along as far as possible. And then when you have to cut the umbilical cord and that child has a high percentage of dying, you do it in a way by accompanying that woman and that family through the tragedy and the suffering because suffering is never ever meant to have you kill to prevent that. Mm -hmm. And I also don't think that suffering is meant to not for you only to embrace it, but how you respond to it. Oh yeah. Whether I'm playing baseball as a 20 year old in college or whether I'm trying to hit a golf ball and teach my children or passing on to my children, wrestling uh, my two boys. um, No, you have to, walk through the fire because ultimately that burning fire becomes the fire of the Holy Spirit as we believe. And it's sanctifying. Yes. And so that's what she did. And as I, but that's the mother here, she is giving away her son as she did her whole life. Oh, I birthed this baby and uh, the innkeeper didn't want it. So we went to this manger. Oh, by the way, the shepherds immediately come she gives him to them. Oh, the Magi come, which we are in that season until the 2nd of February. Mm-hmm. And oh, by the way, uh, we have to run to Egypt. And oh, by the way, my relatives think I'm crazy. And oh, by the way, he has to leave. Uh, it's not the womb that bore me, but it's those who hear my word and keep it. Oh, my Lord, this woman is now this woman is now our mother given to us in scripture on the cross. And now she's holding this dead body, showing us the way. And that's why that prophecy in Simeon is real. It's both the sacred and immaculate heart. She's only immaculate because the sacred heart graced her to do that. She had to live and witness just like you, Ange, just like you and your daughter and your family and your friends. That's what we have to do. Mm -hmm. And even in the face of a world says because they didn't understand him they won't understand you and oh by the way when they gain victory and end my life i'm going to conquer death 
because the wages of sin are death. And that grace that he gave for all of us saves us if we take that grace and then in love and in his power become as perfect as he is perfect as a goal, mm -hmm. not as a crazy, because we're now living in a totally nihilistic, yes. <laughs> materialistic medicine. And the only way when you live the lies that I do on a daily basis that you do with healthcare and the lies that are coming through politics and economics and anthropology and sociology and religion and faith and reason, everything seems to be broken. Yes. The only way you combat lies is to witness the love and mercy and truth of Jesus Christ. And I can tell you that in my story, even though I was in a wonderful evangelical church and I read scripture that they taught me how to read, it wasn't my Ignatian exercises. I wish it was, but now I can use Ignatius on top of what I learned in my non-Catholic days mm -hmm. about the power of faith. But now it's faith acting in love, as Galatians would say, and Corinthians would say, and Romans would say, you know, Abraham had to get up and go to the promised land. He had to act. And he was only given that capacity at his old age because of the power of God. And I'm telling yeah. you, we're here. And if you don't witness it yesterday, just like you, I had to do a TV interview about the Born Alive Act. Mm. And the absurdity but it's really not absurd because yes, because it's the logical end of their well, position. It's science. If yeah. you can't provide prenatal care because you believe it should be killed, why are you able to provide postnatal care? Yes, it's the same bean. It's the same, and they know it. That's no, no. the that's the thing is they well, know. We're at nihilism. This yes. Is, this is transhumanism. It is. This is postmodern. This is, we are so far beyond the abortion debate, even though we're talking about it now. Just think about it. We've accepted for 50 plus years now, class one carcinogens through contraception are good health care because we're going to shut off your fertility and treat children as sexually transmitted diseases yes. that need to be prevented. And oh, by the way, as Casey told us, it's no longer the doctor's purview because that's what Rose said. Rose said, oh no, it's between you and your doctor. Well, now we've gotten the doctor out of it and it's based on a woman's right to abortion on demand up to birth. And yeah. so now it's within the woman's purview. And if we don't provide that, we're somehow um, limiting their freedom, limiting yeah. their happiness. And now we're set with a, nation that is very close to the nation before the civil war with state like can you imagine oklahoma borders colorado and if you cross that state boundary you go from a state where life is protected in the womb to a place where it's not protected right until it survives the birth process in or outside of an abortion Oh, my God. Well, that's Where, what we have right here in Minnesota right now. I yes. mean, almost every state around us either has eliminated abortion or has very severe restrictions on abortion. And so even when I was in the committee hearing, gosh, it'll be a couple of weeks ago from the time that I published this interview. But um, even the the ob -GYN that is operating the Planned Parenthood in St. In St. Paul, Minnesota, which many people may not know this, but the Planned Parenthood in St. Paul might be possibly the largest volume uh, Planned Parenthood in the entire nation. It's a huge mega facility. It's multi-level. Um, it's it's the third largest in the country. And they've seen a 40% increase in women coming from out of state for late-term abortions. And since our county, the Ramsey County judge rescinded all uh, pro-life restrictions, including parental consent, um, minor notification laws, all that stuff, um, but any other laws that we had on the books, they have completely rescinded. So um, it's a free for all. And now 
she can perform an abortion. She can commit an abortion all the way up to birth in her offices. They're looking to include birth centers in that now with this new legislation. Um, and they even emphasized at a committee hearing that one of the legislators, I was so impressed, he goes, so you're telling me that with this law, a minor can be sterilized. Let's say, let's say as young as 10 years old, because now there's no consent, no parental notification. A minor can consent to being completely sterilized without their parents' knowledge. And the woman defending the bill said, yeah, I'm just, I'm just here to, you know, present to you this law that would codify the, the laws as it is on the books. In other words, yes, a minor as young as 10 can receive sterilization in a Planned Parenthood or in a clinic or in the hospital without their parents' consent. And you're right. This is about transhumanism. It is about um, treating women. The irony of it all is that feminism sought to equalize women with men in their minds, right? It's all about um, equality and, uh, and, and whatever that means. And what they, the, the, the underlying premise is that men are superior to women. So you have to eliminate fertility. That's, so they're actually buying in. There's an underlying premise that they've already bought into. It's this assumption. And they're actually bringing about um, not equalization, but an undermining of femininity in its Think entirety. About- because yes. it's in our nature. It is yes. our nature. And that doesn't, it's like that you're just, and then, and then in these committee hearings, these, these Democrats talk about birthing persons, as you mentioned, it's all about stripping away our nature well, and it, using us in, in a utilitarian fashion and where we can be controlled a hundred percent. Without a doubt, without a doubt, just think yeah. of NCAA women's sports. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Think well, about it. Yeah. Think about it. So yeah. experientially, just like abortion. So several things that, that, that you are you've got your finger on the pulse here. One, abortion was a political solution foisted on my profession by the American College of OBGYN, who had some serious abortionists wanting to be protected from the law so they could provide their service. That's history. They left science, they replaced it with politics yes. and a communist ideology. Well, hasn't that been so apparent even the last couple of years, so much more so? I mean, they're not even hiding it anymore. Correct. And that's because words no longer matter, logic no longer matters. And when they say follow the science, they're basically saying like the Russian scientists, follow this the state dominated because now might makes right. So mm-hmm. when they start codifying into law, they're trying to get around the legal structure that is based on reason, science, and natural, you know, and, and transcendental truth, really, in some ways. Transcendental truth where yes. God gives you your rights. Yep. That's been just tossed because you're supposed to hang up your conscience or your faith because conscience and faith are nothing but more than a good feeling and it's private. They don't want you to talk about it in the public square. And so now they're silencing you and they're getting away with it. And we know that because of the Twitter files and we know that what has happened in our political and in our healthcare, if you don't toe the line, if you don't toe the line on, you know, uh, COVID, Uh, you can be punished. Now there's mis and disinformation. Now I'm Polish. So my family grew up in a a Nazi dominated country for a while, then a Russian dominated country. You can smell this stuff a mile away. And yet we have become so comfortable. They are, are, they are truly trying to destroy what the word mother means. Yes. Because it's always about the woman's rights. So politics couches all of this in rights and might makes rights. And yeah. whoever's in control will push those. So there's no more free debate. There's no more free worship because they're close. You know, the world is changing before us. And the only way is witness. Mm-hmm. With all due respect, what happens, as we know, in the book of Acts, it's called advancement through opposition. And right around chapter eight, when Steve, when uh, Stephen, big Steve, I call him, gets stoned. 
It then takes Saul to become Paul to give us the faith we need to suffer with him. We will reign with him. Yes. Amen. We oh, work. my goodness. And so I'm to telling suffer you. Is to reign. Isn't that John Paul II um, wrote that in his encyclical on women? So to serve as terrain. Because we yeah. need to be birthing, you know, it's this idea of being in the, you know, it's it's a new birth. And if you get to Revelation 12, I, I believe that when this woman with child, this mother with child is now facing a beast and the beast is ready to devour the child. And mm -hmm. I, I see it not only as a love story scripture, but yeah. science supports motherhood. The change in the human breast from type one and two cells to type yes. three and four. The micro chimerism that you end up with a real portion of your immediately born child's proteins and genetics in your bloodstream. Can I, can I, I don't mean to interrupt. I just, no. I want to touch on that point with the, no, go, the girl. This is conversation, man. I know, but this is, you know, I think it's so, it's hard to get people to talk honestly about this. Um, and I, I love from your perspective as a physician too, um, you know, the change in breast tissue that doesn't get talked about and the rise in, in rates of breast cancer, things like that. And there's been such a strong denial within the medical community that abortion has had um, this correlation with breast cancer, the ABC link, as I'm sure you know, it's called. Um, I sit on that board. You're right. Do you? Yes. So okay, okay. So you would, you would say absolutely. It makes sense that when you cut off that transition with those cells, as they change and develop, um, that they're more uh, prone to uh, mutating, right? Because you're cutting off that natural process what, before it's matured, right? So, Am I understanding that properly? So, so when I talk about um, like, when I talk about the human family, that we're all one nature, it's that in the beginning was the code and the code was life and the code is in life. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the human genome. I'm talking right. about chromosomes, embryology, cell biology. Who we are, just like you and your children and my children, and my loved ones and my family and my, all of us on all sides of the political debate were once embryos. Yeah. And you can either treat people along this nature of what it means to be human, because those are human parents. We're not a tumor. We're not a, a high, right. a high data for mole. Right. We are a human. An organism. Yes. An organism. And we are destined and designed with rationality even though at times, whether we are sleeping or whether we are, you know, uh, incapacitated. As a, as <laughs> incapacitated or as a young fetus or embryo, no, we don't have the same consciousness that we have, that I have now at right. 62, but that doesn't matter because it's all there. Yeah. And to include them in, so when we say the, our father, it's all part of the human family. That's the first point. The other thing that I was thinking of is that um, the human science, we are a organism that, believe it or not, through proteins and chemicals, we actually engage in our own development. Mm -hmm. and oh, yeah, that's, that's such a great point. It's true. And children right. do it all the time. I mean, like a lot of parents will wonder why their kids stomp around so much. And it's because your child, as their as their body grows, first of all, their bones need that extra pounding to strengthen, but also that sends signals up to the brain to develop properly, to develop the cerebellum and things like that, and even up to the frontal lobe, but especially those those more primitive parts of the brain Thalamus. need the extra stimulus. Thalamus, yes. amygdala. That's why it's really the mid. Yes. And the midline. So it's super important that your kids crawl because you're right. Uh, the way we move helps us develop. And even and, then, if it's underdeveloped, then it, it stunts even our spiritual life. I think it's some ways. And we know that. And we know yeah. that, but we still say because of our politics, gender now has to be fluid and it has to be part of our experience and our will mm -hmm. to define it. 
Right. Rather than the, the science of observation and understanding the nature of what we're studying. And so, uh, you know, I, 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 I begin to see with the human breast, it's a modified sweat gland hmm. early on in a person's life. Mm -hmm. The areola, the nipples, the tissue underneath, it's a quiescent modified sweat gland. And it's sitting there waiting for that pregnancy, that other person mm -hmm. to interact with it to be make yes. it healthy, it's relational. Now at it, that point it might be proteins talking to one another. That's such a good point too though, but because like even when a baby- That's how they talk. Yeah. That's their oh, form man. of communication. Yes, and your body responds in kind. So like if your child is sick and, and is nursing, then the body responds, it receives that, that bacteria into the breast tissue and creates the antibodies in the breast milk that the child needs to get over the illness. That's why breastfeeding is so important. Uh, if you, I mean, I understand that there are circumstances. I feel like this no, caveat no. always has to be said because no, it get does. Very upset. but it's so important. It's so beneficial for your child for so many reasons. And this is just one of them. It's a, it's a protective force okay. that is, it's this protective mechanism built within the, the woman's body for her child. Right. And so what we're finding is, is that um, as that interaction happens, as the child grows, you know, all these studies that talk about breast cancer and, you know, the, the denial, those are usually yeah. studies done on later abortions because once oh, those yeah. cells get, so, you know, there's this whole idea. And, and I believe that it's, that it was done because the people doing the studies had a political point to push. And yeah. so for oh, instance, absolutely. So, it's money, so, money. Right. Yeah. Yes, it is. Uh, all follow, of it is. Follow so the money. Much. Right. So yeah, don't follow the you know, science. Follow it? the what money. Is this? Yeah. So, yeah. so what happens is, is that um, when a full mature breast is making milk towards the end of the gestation and into the infancy, those are type three and four cells and they are fully milk producing. That transition from one and two to three and four, they get trapped in limbo or in transition. And cells that are not given the code to do what they were designed to do, whether to keep it quiet when you were a, a young woman without ever being pregnant, that's why the age of first abortion is so crucial or the age of first term birth mm. is crucial to the breast cancer data. Mm. And, and what happens is those cells get caught in limbo. Now, this is the science of it. But we also know, just from a simple epidemiological study, the two countries that legalized abortion first were China and Russia. And by 1960, those were the two countries that had escalating breast cancer numbers. So can Number I... one. Oh, yes. okay, yeah, second, finish your the point. the second thing I want to say... And then I have a question. And then, and then one of the second things I want to say is that there's another study that everybody um, talks about from either the NCI, National Cancer Institute, or the one? NIH, I can't remember yeah. which, but I think the last name of the lead author was Dahling, D-A-H-L-I-N-G. She comes to the conclusion that there's no association between abortion and breast cancer. But in the subgroup of probably, I think, 15 people who had a family history of breast cancer and aborted their first child during their teen years, those women, I believe, and I might be mistaken, 12 out of 12 or 15 out of 15, all, all developed breast cancer before the age of 50. Wow. And they all developed the triple negative, the worst kind of cancer. Wow. So not only are we seeing women with earlier cancers of the breast, 
We always thought they were 60, 70, and 80-year-olds that got it because we know historically that breast cancer is about one in eight to one in nine deaths, cause of deaths in a woman in her 90th decade, you know, in her ninth decade of life. Yeah. Um, now we're seeing it in 30, 40, 50 year olds. Wow. Because we're hearing about it in the news. Yeah. And so all I'm saying is, is that when we talk about science, science, just like religion. So because of the, because of the Renaissance and because of um, the Enlightenment, as we call it, we have torn apart and fractured the connection in the religious community about truth and interpretation because of the many divisions now we have in the body of Christ. Mm. And now in science, we have a fractured we have a fracture because we can even show the data now and they just have more studies that were done by more of their people. Mm -hmm. And it's become a, not a matter of the heart. And once again, when I talk to patients, unless you're having, unless you're having, um, unless you're having treatment for a cancer or some, you go to a university because you're suffering with a disease that needs the most current evidence. Evidence-based medicine is also a lie. Well, and it takes over, it takes almost two decades to get the evidence at, sorted no, no, out, at right? Least, at least, Angela, at least. And yet with COVID, we had it immediately. Oh, yes, that was based just like on the big plague. No, so once again, the ACOG promulgated abortion is good medicine and is needed in the 1970s. They wrote the brief and they became, they have become more and more of a political action committee that on every abortion decision in any state or at the experts, which are the abortion desiring hierarchy, of our profession that's shutting down conversation and um, real debate and just that conversation of the heart. And yeah. patients are listening to their doctors and listening to their pastors. We now have all that um, in shambles and people have lost trust in their church. They have lost trust in medicine. And it's not because of dis or misinformation. It's because politics has taken over. I was going to say, politics has become their religion. Yes, but we also gave them reason to do that. Mm -hmm. We've kept our mouths shut and we've done bad things. Yeah. And yet we throw the baby out with the bathwater, which is a very apropos comment to my OB world, because guess what? Now, uh, the chemical abortion, medical abortion, literally is now the vast majority of abortions done in this country. Yeah, They're now being pushed telemedically. They're now being pushed to such a degree because I've now considered them SNA abortions. SNA like um, SNM in that same perverted sex is so beautiful and true and good. We've perverted it and destroyed the meanings S yeah. is about is about the starvation of your unborn child who needs progesterone. The mifepristone says, oh, no, 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 I'm going to compete with that. So you can't eat it and grow to be you. Right. Starvation. And then what have we done? We've abandoned our patients to virtual reality. We mm -hmm. basically see them, hi, hi, Ange, I'm doing over telemedicine right now. Mm -hmm. We're going to do telemedicine. Tell me your story. Oh, I believe you. You can go get your pills at your pharmacy. I can be an RN. I can be a, a nurse nurse practitioner. I don't even have to be a doctor because right. we, now have, we now have laws in Michigan and in California where- And, you, and you're relying on them to tell you exactly how far along they are even or, or their and health it, and history. And not in a topic. Correct. Yes. And and it's because like you are leaving these women completely 
<laughs> vulnerable. And and that's the other thing I've just been harping on is like, of course, these women take advantage of more than they ever have been. They're already being taken advantage of by the and sex traffickers and abusers. And now you're making that process so much easier for well, them. Well, because plan B is now o was over the counter. Oh, when it was empty on the, the shelf FDA. at my local grocery store last Same week. Here. I was like, Same here. oh my goodness, it's so disgusting How, and sad. Well, it is, but but it's because we just, we realized that this is part of our new, it's a lie. And so as we decide to put a wedge between a mother and her child, and tell her openly, you should be able to, for essential health care and happiness, you can end the pregnancy and go back to your motherhood or your mm -hmm. womanhood, and it's all going to be okay. Yeah. Now, we know through Silent No More and uh, other, you know, Project Rachel and the Catholic community, yeah. post-abortion trauma is significant. It is. Can you, can you imagine, Angela? the abandonment portion of SNA abortions, mm. the chemical or medical, yeah. and, we, and we argue about language, mm -hmm. you are going to brutally, cramping, painfully, And it's dangerous. I mean. Explode. No, but yes, it is dangerous. It's of more it statistically is. dangerous than even a surgical abortion. No, it is. But because statistics no longer mean anything people do, people do <laughs> things they don't mean anything anymore yeah. you can't even argue statistics yeah uh sadly it has to be now experience so yes. these women are going to go into their bed because that's where you go when the cramps heat with the hot water and yeah. oh by the way that's where you take your advil or your pot or whatever you're using to numb you and oh by the way you have to walk from your bed to the bathroom when you really feel it getting close, just like you do at home births and other things, yeah. there's many things you do. And then you're going to go sit on the toilet if you make it that far. And the explosive nature of the mifepristone and the methotre and the um, yeah, methotrexate, I think. Is well, right. no, no, it's not right? methotrexate. It's the um, oh, well, I'm blanking on the it's the it's the uh, anti it's the uh, stomach. Um, it's the cytotech. Oh, yeah. Cytotech yep. causing the cramping. All of a sudden. You're going to expel. Now, if the child is more than eight weeks, seven weeks, you might see a fetus. You might feel and see chunks of red clotted gelatin that's going to be coming out of you. And then you don't know how much blood is normal to lose. Yeah. That image that's going to go through their eyes, which is what? The window of the soul, whether you like yes, it or not, so goes true. directly into your heart, your core. It goes into your heart, your guts, your womb, that place that we call the soul. Yeah. And you begin to have, you've gone from, I'm a part of the status quo. Abortion is needed and it's my right. To a place where you're going to have cognitive and visceral dissidence. Yeah, that's the connection. And we're now going to do it in spades because of chemical, medical, SNA, starvation and abandonment abortions. And since they're now the going trend, God have mercy on us. Yeah. And I pray that we have the heart and the stamina and the compassion to be vessels of divine mercy care. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you this, I'm now president of divine mercy care. And I don't mean just my organization, but I am talking about all of us who work in the pregnancy center movement, just like in my office, Tepeyac in Fairfax, Virginia, we partnered with all these regional pregnancy centers the quote unquote fake centers that Planned Parenthood says. I uh, used to run one. I ran one the, for two years. Yeah. Well, no, I I yeah. was working at a pregnancy center in an evangelical community while I was doing the abortions. So I was yeah. not only part of the status quo, but I had that cognitive dissonance oh going goodness, from. Yeah. It's the craziness, dude. It, my Angela, and that's what your program, this conversation. Yeah, this has been a is, great conversation. Well, no, no, it's like the dirty little secret. Because it's experiential yeah. as well as it is scientific 
as well as it is biblical and yes. scriptural and traditional. It's but it's all it, it connects all of us across different denominations and different silos. And yet we've lost the battle like the mother did that day on that hill outside the walls of Jerusalem. That Good Friday became good because the sacrifice and the love of Jesus, it's unconditional love. That's the unconditional love of a mother. That's the unconditional love of Mary. Oh, by the way, that's the unconditional love of Angela. Mm -hmm. And it's not that you're better. No, you have to share this mm -hmm. because it's not easy as a human being to embrace suffering or pain. Mm. And it's not easy to disciple or to educate or to walk with a woman who is underserved to begin with. Yes. And yet they yeah. talk about access because they think this is going to save them and be able to get them a place that less, more money means more happiness. Yeah. <clears throat> Wrong answer. I have, I have like two thoughts here. Go that I'm like, yeah, I yeah, have I'm to, I have yeah, go to ahead, say please. it before I forget. So, you know, it's just so fascinating too, because as you describe what that SNA abortion is like, um, and at the same time, as we've discussed, while she's having this abortion, while she is experiencing this cognitive dissonance, she's receiving this, uh, this imagery into her very body. She's experiencing it. her body will remember this. And not only that, but the very cells of her child will also reside within her for very long time. Some, some speculate till death, but I think some too will say maybe not quite that long, but for a very long time, her child will live, those cells of her very child will live within her. And so her body has this memory imprinted very within her very bloodstream. And of course her heart and her mind and her soul. And so you, you see all this and I, I, it's like, you see all these parts. You've talked about how the medical system separates that mother child dyad immediately creating this division from, I mean, from the very moment that child is born, they're separated often within the hospital setting and they're not allowed to sleep by each other for whatever reason, you know, and then they're not necessarily encouraging breastfeeding. I know some of that is changing in some parts, but all of these things that really strengthen the bond between a mother and her child. It, it's, it's being severed from the moment she finds out she's pregnant. Don't talk about it as your baby. It's the it's the pregnancy. It's not your child. Um, and then you, you have, you have your child and they're like, well, if you need to supplement, you should do that right away instead of helping assist her nurse, her child. And so then you're breaking off that bond. You're separating them, making, putting them in a crib in another room very early on, putting them in daycare very early on all of these things for keeping women in the workforce. So she her, those bonds are loosed and we've created an, an, an economy that requires women oftentimes to work. So there are all of these levels. And so my question for you is um, because it, you're right, it's political, it's economic, it's medical. Um, and so often, even within the medical community, these women are left abandoned by their providers, offering them little in the way of protection and help, leaving women vulnerable to an industry that will capitalize on every so-called wrong thing, not helping her heal her body from the inside out, but placing a Band-Aid on it, Band-Aid after Band-Aid, leaving her wounded. And um, so my question for you is, because then you look at the spiritual level and it's like you see that this division between the mother and her child um, and the, the way that the enemy waits and lies in wait to receive that child and to separate our lady from the son, because it was through her goodness and her holiness. You see it in abortion. Abortion is just the complete mockery of our Lord made incarnate, but also our lady who was the Ark of the Covenant to, to defile that in such a way. Do you see abortion with its ties to in vitro fertilization, embryonic stem cell research, vaccine development and research, and every other thing and, and end of life issues. It's like, it's so all encompassing. Right. Do you see this as the last battle? Do you see, like I'm yeah. think, channeling C.S. Lewis right now, but it, it really, to me, I look at this issue and the reason it's so important is because it, it reaches into the depths of the human person, our dignity, um, understanding our Lord made incarnate, it's such an affront to our Lord and to us and our dignity. And so 
my question for you is when you look at how all encompassing and global this issue is, do you think that this is kind of the last the yeah. last thing? Well, um, I, I absolutely I, I'm not sure the word last is the or right not last. Way. No, but you because, know, what but, it, yes. but no, 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 I do. I know. No, <laughs> absolutely. In fact, I actually think. We are going to birth. The, the body of Christ, the people of God, the people of, you know, we just finished uh, celebrating Christmas. Glory to God in the highest. Point one. And peace to people of goodwill. Mm. Point two. He came here not so much for peace, but for making sure that goodwill is connected to the glory of God. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I fully believe that from a medical point of view, what you just talked about, the politicalization of the human person and the, and the denial, the lies of the reality of the human person in science is at the core of medicine it's the core of our problem we've tried we've become our own gods as physicians and as mothers and there's this whole idea that the two are at each other's throats because we no longer help each other and so what happens is is that once you can you imagine we're so polarizing moms and their unborn child the woman and the fetus that's that's one language we go out of our way to kill it in the womb, prevent it before it gets there, or when it's implanting, starve it. And, oh, by the way, we need to tear apart the tubes because they work too well. Yeah. And our happiness is in about sex, uh, reproductive health rather than procreative health. And so all of a sudden, there's nothing to the human person except chemicals and electricity and, you know, um, it's very materialistic. Yes, very dualistic, materialistic. Yeah. And so that goes all the way up to the point of now. Yesterday, you and I both talked about what? Oh, killing infanticide is now a part of abortion because you need to kill them because the child's not wanted anyway. And the defense is, well, appropriate medical care when legal. That's the phrase they've been using mm -hmm. to combat that bill. It's because appropriate means whatever the mighty. It's have so decided. subjective. Yes. There you go. So now, now we go back to IVF. And what I tell people is um, before you go to IVF, so let's say we do our best at Tepiac. Uh, one of the principles of divine mercy care is hate the disease, love the patient. Yeah. And so love means unconditional love, accompany them through their suffering, which is the meaning of compassion. And it yes. moves from compassion to mercy yeah. because you can't leave it alongside of um, where you feel empathy. You got to move it to compassion. But then ultimately for us believers, it's divine mercy. It's that total walking with. Now, in IVF, if, if you treat the disease and it's still not getting what the mother and father want or the partners want, they're going to go to IVF. And I tell them when before they go, oh, by the way. Before you go, you and your partner need to answer this one question. Are the embryos they make your property or your children? Mm. Do you own them or do you love them? Because that's going to make a difference whether you can freeze them, whether you can manipulate them, because you wouldn't do that to your young girl sitting on your lap, your daughter. You wouldn't do that to her. You wouldn't freeze her, would you? Right, no. You wouldn't, you wouldn't put her in a put her in a place where only six out of 10 times that vehicle you placed her in is going to make it to its destination. Right. You're not going to do that. And so that's one way. The other way is um, the other principle at divine mercy care. That first principle is that health is based on relate is relational and it's based on sacrificial relationships, unconditional relationships between you and your doctor, you and your partner, you and your husband, you and your family. 
Mm. And oh, by the way, there is a higher power and you're not it because health is about body, soul, and spirit. Mm. Oh, Angela, you look a little sad today. Is there anything wrong? Is there anything I can help you with? Is there anything I can pray for you? When you look at body language, when you look at a woman. Yes, who, it shows through, you their interior disposition. Yes, I talked about that. Yes. yes. Oh, I know. Listen, I've, um, with our friendship, I've kind of stalked you a little bit. On oh, my social. gosh. So I just want you to know that I appreciate this because these are things that oftentimes we don't talk about in mm -hmm. nice settings. And this is a setting where heart meets heart, core mm -hmm. odd core. And I think we're just trying to share the joy and the peace that we have found in this way. We want to share it with, I want to share it with patients and medical students and young doctors and old doctors who are burned out. That's what Divine Mercy Care is now doing. Also raising money to help the nonprofit. We also believe in almsgiving to bring back, to kind of begin to control the profit motive. But yeah. what I'm trying to say to you, uh, answering your real question, is that health is relational. There is a higher power and you're not it. So if you don't believe in anything, you better start getting silent and you better meditate or pray. If you are a theist, you better start praying to God. If you are going to God, you need to listen more mm -hmm. because he's our daddy. He's our Abba. And it's experiential. As I often hear, has my son ever let you down? Yes. In the world's view, the pain and suffering and illnesses that I've had that have made me go to the Pieta, that image, John 19, 26, 27, I'm telling, I'm telling myself here as much as I'm telling others that there is a way that is so much healthier and holistic. And when you say, is it all connected? You're damn, you're darn right it is. <laughs> abortion, yeah. abortion is not the center. What has happened to comprehensive, collaborative, holistic, integrated women's health? No, gender-wise, you're actually an afterthought because now it's pregnant people. We're going to remove pregnant women. We're mm -hmm. going to, we're going to bastardize the word woman. We're going to remember when they used to say the future is female. Remember that? Do you remember they used to say well, that? Well, they also used to say abortion safe, legal, and rare. Right. And right? they don't anymore because they don't want it to be safe, legal, or safe or rare. They just want it legal. Correct. Yep. And so what happens is as we go forward, we have to witness with ourselves, with our lives, whether you do it through this incredible family that you have, this incredible work you do, what I do, what so many of us, because it was your peeps, the folks that follow you, and so many of the world that prayed for people like me. Mm -hmm. My conversion, yes, there was data coming in about abortion and breast cancer, abortion and preterm birth, abortion and uh, mental illness, but it wasn't just the data. Yes, there was data coming through about the social issues of what broken families, especially in the African-American community. Mm, yeah. Well, now we're all like this. It's just we're all in free fall. And the reality is, is that only by witness now can we be a light. Because if words no longer matter and logic no longer matters and arguments no longer matter and science can be fungible as well as faith. We don't need to seek a truth outside of ourselves. We can read it and interpret it as we see. That was the only thing that moved me out of my evangelical church, back to the Catholic church that had a magisterium where for 2000 plus years, we've had tens of thousands of really good humans, sinful humans, but people who have come together under the promise of what the Holy Spirit was given to the church, the church that guides us and shows us the way of medicine, the way of motherhood, the way of family. Once again, 
I had to find something other than interpretation. And even though I love my non-Catholic brothers and sisters, I love going to praise and worship. I love being in the word. I absolutely love it. When I asked, do you have a formal teaching on abortion? It depended on where they were. Mm -hmm. And that's the challenge that I had. And even though I welcome, you know, I believe that this is one body of Christ and we have so many more commonalities than we do oppositions. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the unity of the body of Christ that he talked about in John 17 and, you know, John 21, this idea that we all may be one. We need to go not only to truly our, one. Yes. Truly and, one. One in mind and spirit. Yes. And to go across the line and help those who don't see it because they still have flickers, I believe, of that light and that still quiet voice inside them. Mm. And just by talking about these challenges in this conversation, I'm reading a book now called Conversational Intelligence. And it's this wonderful work about how conversations can still transform people of goodwill. Mm -hmm. That's the key. There's no polarization. But here we have, like you just described beautifully, a mom and her fetus, a mom and her baby. Oh, they're polarized to the point of killing one. Mm -hmm. Oh, and by the way, the child, though, that pregnancy is going to kill you. Oh, my Lord. Yeah, it's so, yeah. always well, they're put pitted together. Yes. Well, fear. What was the other question you had? Honestly, I don't remember, but oh, I'm sorry. No, that's OK. This has been such a wonderful conversation, and I'm so glad that we were able to kind of oh. weave together this understanding of the human person and of motherhood um, in a way that brings together the Lord and how he designed us, how he calls us to be in relationship with him and one another, but also the the reality and how we experience it in the physical world and the forces that we're dealing with. So where can people find out more about you, your work, and where can they buy your book? Sure. So uh, two patients, uh, my conversion from abortion to life affirming <laughs> health care, life affirming medicine was so generously picked up by Ignatius Press. Oh, so that's good. The, so that's the first place that I would go. Um, it's also found. Um, um, you can also find it out at uh, two patients dot com. Um, uh, also at uh, Dr. John Burchowski, uh, dot com, uh, Divine Mercy Care dot org. That's where you can reach out to me, especially if you have some patient questions or, you know, often we're 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 really pushing um, kind of a relational approach to getting through uh, college, grad school, medical school, residency, nursing school nurse practitioner, physician assistant schools, DO schools, especially if you don't feel like you fit in, get a hold of us. Please <laughs> reach out because we're part, we're about relation making, but we're also, we have, you know, we've been around for so long and I'm so old that I know all these wonderful, wonderful groups, Christian Medical and Dental Society, Catholic Medical Association, American Association of Pro-Life OBGYNs, Project Rachel, Pregnancy centers, whether you're Heartbeat International or, or CareNet, Care Net, yeah. Listen, listen. This is, this is the, this is what you do. I mean, this is, this is the grace of Jesus Christ in your life because of His death and resurrection moves you into service and action. It's the, it's the, um, it's the people given to, with talents. It's the go back and thank him when you're healed of leprosy like I was, the leprosy of pitting mom against child. No, we're we're in medicine, we're trying to create a, a an approach alongside any of the NAPRO technologists, the fertility awareness-based methods, all men and women who actually will care for the underserved in their own practices, in their own communities, building a net of people in a certain location where abortion may not become illegal, but it might become unwantable. It's that transformation of heart through healthcare, through medicine, that divine mercy care 
and Tepeyac, O-B-G-Y-N, dot com. That's T-E-P-E-Y-A-C, O-B-G-Y-N, dot com. Those are all the sites that you can find the book, but that you can begin a conversation or a journey or a path or just help. Even if you disagree, we we take <laughs> we take all comers and I'm interested because I respect where you're coming from. I really do. We all do. And the way you speak, Angela, what you do, even though it's about life and death, both in this world and maybe for eternity, mm. um, there's a certain there's a certain mercy that sees all of these folks as members of our human family, even those who violently disagree with us, mm -hmm. because the reality of the summer of Jane's revenge and the mm. anger and bitterness I see is nothing more than a manifestation of post-traumatic stress syndrome, PTSD. I'm sure that a saliva test would show their adrenals are severely fatigued, their thyroids are wacky, their whole body, because we are unity, remember? You mm -hmm. can't just split these things apart like philosophers and theologians yeah. and physicians want to do. And we have to provide better, holistic, integrated, comprehensive medical care from beginning to end. We need to educate people about their language of their body. Because like when I, when I eventually come and hug you and see you, I'm going to hug, I'm going to hug Angela, the whole person. Mm. And if I ever get a chance to squeeze on your daughter, I'm going to squeeze your daughter. I'm not squeezing <laughs> her body. She's not an ensouled spirit. She's right. Or an embodied a, spirit. Yes. Or an embodied spirit. Excuse yes. me. I'm sorry. An embodied or an ensouled spirit. body. Yes. 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 I'm with you. And, and so just this going back and forth, you have helped me again, you know, find peace in the perseverance, no matter what the politics change, no matter how the world seems. I just know that as Paul teach, taught me, hope against hope, Johnny, hope against hope. And that's what that Pieta was also, Paul and the Pieta. It's about hope against hope. It's about holding the dead body of Christ and knowing that it's resurrected and that there's something better coming. And it's far greater than we can imagine. And I believe that your, your work and our work, alongside many others, including even the hard, even the abortion folks, all things work to the good to those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Anyone of goodwill, even after suffering an abortion, there is God's mercy on that forgiveness. Yes, there's great um, uh, psychological systems like IFS, internal family systems, that you can forgive yourself. There's a better way out there. You don't have to be trapped and starved for the truth and for love. You are beloved by Jesus Christ. You are. And you don't have to be alone. No, it's so shamed. Your parents will never understand you. Your boyfriend and partner won't understand you. No, 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 no. Don't tell anybody. Oh, no. If you are going to tell somebody, shout it from the rooftop. Yeah. As if it's good. Oh, my word. Oh, yeah. by the way, it should be over the counter. Oh, by the way, there should be no direct care visit. We shouldn't examine you. We, we can do it over telehealth. Oh, no, abortion and sexual freedom. No, no, that's just, that's like a norm. This is part of the rite of passage. And it should be like eating a good breakfast, right? Wow, or getting a tooth taken out. Amen. Right, tooth pulled. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of that with uh, myself and everyone who's going to listen to this episode on Integrated. I just am so grateful for you and, <laughs> and your here. work. Thank you so much. God bless you. God bless you, Angela.